had a great Thanksgiving holiday. And I know Tiffany and I sure, certainly did up in Michigan. Obviously, it's a great time uh, to see friends and family and to spend that Thanksgiving holiday with them. So moving along, uh, now part three of our John 17 sermon series. And I'm not going to lie, when I started this, I was a little worried that, uh, man, am I really going to go through a sermon series and preach eight to ten sermons on one chapter of Scripture? Uh, but I'm reminded each and every week how so much deep information, deep spiritual truth is in this passage and how much reflective and intimate things are in this chapter that are so worth going through as a church and so worth going through uh, as believers and uh, as a pastor to preach through and to study each and every week. And I'm reminded each and every week why I chose this. Again, that intimacy, that reflectiveness uh, is very healthy for us as believers to look at and to draw closer to the Lord Jesus. Well, as an American history buff and an avid movie watcher, I can't help but to kind of combine those two interests of mine over the years and become a fan of historical films. And more specifically, films that highlight a specific person or a specific event. And back in 2012, uh, the blockbuster Steven Spielberg movie Lincoln was a big hit in theaters, and it told the tale of President Lincoln in the last few months of his office back in 1865 of uh, transitioning out and obviously after the Emancipation Proclamation in Gettysburg and, and then the few couple months of his life in 1865. And then another movie that came out not too long after that, Hacksaw Ridge, uh, that looks at the life of Desmond Doss, who was a United States corporal who served as a combat medic in World War II, uh, who was a devout Christian, he was a believer who refused to carry any type of weapon or firearm of any sort in the war, and he received the Medal of Honor uh, because of the lives that he saved uh, without using a firearm because of his faith. A great uh, historical film that tells the tale of Mr. Desmond Doss. And this past summer, making over $950 million in the box office was Oppenheimer. And that looked at J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was in charge of the Manhattan Project during World War II, that was responsible for, most famously responsible for the creation of the atomic bombs that dropped the bomb on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And certainly I do want to say those three films do contain some sensitive matters. So I'm not endorsing any of those three movies from the pulpit in no way, shape or form. But uh, the reason I bring this up is because it takes really someone special to be able to make such a successful historical film like these films and countless other films. It takes a special director who is passionate and he's fully aware of all the events, historically accurate events and the details that circulated around the individual in which he's producing a film about. And it takes actors and directors who have studied their history well, who knows the characters in which they are playing and uh, to make a special person to really manifest those characters into someone else's personality and really emulate their lives. Well, that word emulate is not in our text here, but that word manifest is, manifest themselves. And today we're going to be looking at how Jesus is reflecting on how he manifested the person of God when he came down to earth. So let's look at our text here this morning. Let's look at John chapter 17. We're going to be looking at three verses here, verses 6, 7, and 8. John chapter 17, verses 6 through 8. And throughout our message here today, I'm going to be displaying a lot of scripture here today. Uh, we're going to be looking at a lot of reflective things of Jesus with this prayer and looking at his ministry and some of the other things that pop up uh, throughout scripture. And uh, we'll even be dabbling a little bit in Paul's letters as well. But uh, John chapter 17, verses 6 through 8. There's that word right there in verse 1. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So just think. A little over two years. That's how long, that's how short Jesus' ministry on earth was. 
And in that short amount of time, he had the impact, right? He had the time, he had the impact to impact and, and have influence on the nation of Israel to live out that messianic role on earth. Think of all the things Jesus was able to do in that short amount of time. And when we put that into perspective, when we look at the Gospels, we look at Matthew, look at Mark and Luke and John, it makes those Gospel stories so much more special in knowing how effective his ministry was. And to see the lives that he was able to change and influence of pointing them to God the Father. Knowing that, that that short window of time, that short window of opportunity to change the nation, and of course we now know to change the world to himself, to manifest God's name, the Gospels are filled with these accounts. And yes, in that short amount of time, he was able to do exactly that, manifest, manifest the name of God to the disciples. And Now when Jesus says, manifest your name, um, a little confusing, at least for me, of what exactly does that mean? I, I see it. I, I know what that word means. Well, how do we put this into interpretation? Well, when we're looking at Scripture, we do know that names are more than names, right? Names represent character and identity. And looking back to our passage, we can conclude that Jesus didn't just teach about the name and the attributes of God on earth but instead he manifested. This is something deeper. He displayed, he lived out the very character and nature and attributes of God. It's more than teaching, it's becoming those things. And back to our now opening point with, with the films, right? When an actor or an actress has the role of playing a real life person who lived in a film, well, they better manifest that character of that individual that they're playing. If they want any sort of success in that film, they better do it right. They better know the ins and outs and the details of that character and not just be like them, but become them in that role. So again, this is more than imitating. This is becoming. This is Jesus becoming the name of God to the people in which he gave. Okay, and in this case with Jesus being fully God already, it certainly throws your head for a loop of trying to piece this all together. But the truth is, Jesus is the essence of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. And I think back to our scripture reading all the way back last Sunday, which seems like an eternity ago. And the author of Hebrews writes, he says that Jesus is the radiance, the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And although you and I can never be the radiance of God's glory, nor, nor can we ever become the exact imprint of God, you and I as members of the body of Christ, as the church, can still be Christ-like. We can still imitate him. Again, Jesus did more than imitating, but at least we can imitate. We can be Christ-like on earth. And uh, I want to look at some some application for us as believers at the church in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragment offering and a sacrifice to God. So yes, we as the church cannot be the true radiance, the true imprint of his nature. We can be imitators. Even if Jesus was more than that, we still have application. There's still things for us to look at here in this passage and conclude that we can live out as believers here in the church. And manifesting his name, our text says that he did it to the people whom you, which is God, gave him out of the world. And I think it's clear to, to think and to conclude that, well, no people saw this as clearly as the 12. Right? The 12 disciples who were there with Jesus, who were walked with Jesus, who were there during these, these ministry accounts, these events, no one understood that Jesus was manifesting his name more than the 12. And in Luke chapter 6, when Jesus calls the disciples by name, um, this is a, a passage in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, Right before 
that, right, before he calls them by name in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, in the last days, he went to the mountains to pray. So prayer, prayer is the essence of this. In this John 17 passage, what is it? It's a prayer. But in the gathering of his disciples and starting his ministry, he prayed. He prayed about the people in whom God would send him. He prayed about the impact of the 12 and the people that God would send because of his sovereignty that he would impact and that he would show this manifested love of God, this manifested of God himself. So where I'm getting at with all this is that prayer, dependence on the Father, it helped Jesus manifest the Father's name to those in whom he gave. Okay, let's move on here to verse 7. Verse 7 of our John 17 passage. Again, we're going through each of these details. We're, we're dissecting as a church every part of this deep, intimate prayer. And this one part is a part of our prayer. Let's look at it. John 17, 7. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Okay, I suppose this may be a, a good verse to look at during the Thanksgiving week, but remember context is key. Context is the most important thing when we look at Scripture. And this is Jesus' acknowledgement. This is his recognition of the blessings that the Father has bestowed upon him. It's recognizing what he has given him. And now the disciples seeing that recognition of knowing where it came from. So think of it. Jesus performed miracles. He had power. And that's the reason why I think his ministry was able to grow at the rate, uh, at the exponential rate that it was able to do. Okay, miracles, power, seeing wonders, knowing that this isn't just a, a common everyday man. This guy's a little different. This guy's a little special. And again, the they that they are referring to here that Jesus is talking about in this prayer, that they, now they, that they is looking at the disciples here. But of course, they weren't the only ones in the land who realized the powers, the ability, the God-like being that Jesus had. And, and they weren't the only ones that concluded that these were sent and these were from God himself. Do we remember the Pharisee, Nicodemus, in John chapter 3? Was he at one of the 12? No, he wasn't. He was the man in, in John chapter 3 whom Jesus visited by night because he didn't want the other religious leaders of his day to see him talking with Jesus. Do you remember the very first thing he told Jesus? He said, Rabbi, middle of the night, so no one could see. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher. Come from God. For no one could do any of these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know it's from you. Jesus really had a pretty special ministry. He had a special ministry that he was able to point everyone, everyone to God. Even those who wouldn't embrace his deity, even, though, even the ones that would reject his messianic ability, that rejecting him as a messiah, even the ones that said these powers were, were from demons, right? These people couldn't deny there was something special. And Nicodemus right here, I'm not quite sure if he fully embraced Jesus as Messiah. I don't think he did at this point. But he still says, we know that this was from God. We know that no one could do these signs unless it was from God himself. Jesus was living for God. Living for God, for Jesus, though, was more than just living for him. It was being him. Okay, living for God was being God for God in the flesh. And he's reflecting back at that. He's pointing people to Jesus, pointing people to God for Jesus was being God. So living for God for Jesus was being God, but also pointing to God for Jesus was being God. And lastly, as being the son of God in the flesh, that too meant being God, being God. God was everything for Jesus in his ministry. And now we get to John 17, and he's reflecting on those realities. He's reflecting on that truth of knowing and acknowledging what these things are. And yes, in these final hours of Jesus' life, 
He understands that his disciples know who he is. He understands that they know who sent him. But now they're hours away from seeing why he came. Do we see the difference? They know who he is. They know who sent him. But they don't quite know fully why he came. He came to die. He came to go to the cross. And he knows it will take time for them to see the big picture. But now the hour has come for them to see the Father glorify the Son, but the Son may glorify him. This is what this prayer is all about. This reflective intimacy between God, the Father, and Christ the Son of looking at this ministry and looking at the future. And I want to spend the next, uh, I don't know, we have 10, 15 minutes that we have so left looking at unraveling verse 8 together as a church. And verse 8 summarizes, I think, everything that we've talked about this morning with manifesting the name of God to ministering to the people in whom God sent. Okay, and this is John chapter 17, verse 8. Okay. For I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have realized them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. Okay, so by manifesting the name of God, Jesus didn't just heal. He didn't just do miracles and reveal his deity in that way. But he also taught in speech by his nature of being both fully man and fully God. And what I mean by that, and to summarize all of this, I think we don't have to look much further than in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. This is Jesus walking into the temple here, okay? As it was according to his custom, is what Luke chapter 4 tells us. And he walks into this temple, and he opens up a scroll, the scroll of Isaiah 61. And now Jesus is in the temple starting his ministry, reading the scroll of Isaiah 61. Okay, reflecting back, I can't help but to think this may have come to mind with Jesus. I'm only speculating. But what does Jesus say in the temple? He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom or liberty for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind to set the oppressed free. Okay, why did I bring this up? Well, because after Jesus read the scroll in the temple, he says, today the scripture is fulfilled through me. Where I'm getting at with all this is as the manifest God, as manifested God in the flesh as Jesus was, he did preach good news to the poor. He did give the poor, he, or he talked about the poor, the spirit, and the poor in resources of a heavenly kingdom. He pointed them to eternity. And the Lord certainly anointed him because that's what this is all about, right? The Lord sending him to the world. And he also provided freedom for those who are in addictions and bound in chains to those sins. So at this point in John 17 now, Jesus has done all these things in his ministry as was prophesied for him to do in Isaiah 61. And now, he, and of course the context in Luke 4 is he said these things to set up his ministry, that today these are fulfilled through me and he certainly lived that out. Okay. So the Lord gave him the words to say and he manifested those words in speech but also in action. So that Luke 4 passage of Jesus quoting Isaiah 61 is so great for us to look at. It's so great to see the what in what Jesus did. But it still doesn't show us the why. It shows us the what of what he was able to do and accomplish, but it doesn't give us the reason to ask us for it. And, and the how, to answer that, the how is that by speaking and raising mankind's ethics, to the highest standard possible. He himself lived the kind of life in which he preached. The message in which he taught 
was the message in which how he lived. And for example, we know he told the disciples, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say that every one of you, that whoever looks on a woman with lust has already committed adultery with their heart. So think of it. He himself lived by the words in which the Father gave him. He demanded that the disciples did the same. Could the disciples do that perfectly? No. <laughs> Can we do that perfectly? No. But could they at least intentionally practice these things? Could they pursue these things through pursuing God? Yes, of course. Yes. And concerning the disciples receiving and living out the teachings of Christ, Jesus says in our text here that they have received them. Go back there. That they have received them. And they have come to know in truth that I came to you. So think of it. They received it. Not only did they receive the words, but they came to know the truth. And the truth is that I came for you, says Jesus. And of course, the disciples couldn't understand everything about Jesus at this point or his ministry. But at this point in the gospel narrative, at this point of hours before his betrayal and death, at this point, before they would watch their friend be crucified, they at least were convinced that Jesus and his words were of God. They at least were convinced that these things were true, that Jesus was the manifested nature of God, and that everything Jesus did, looking at this three verses here, looking at all of that, of that he came to do what he was set out to do, that he taught, not just in speech, but with action. And we already looked at what Nicodemus, who was, of course, not one of the disciples, had to say about him. Let's remind ourselves from the first confession. Peter's confession, it's called. Or the first confession of what it's called, but really this is Peter's confession. And this is hours after Jesus fed the 5,000. And Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? Peter says, well, some say, you know, you're John the Baptist. Others maybe say you're Elijah. And he says, no, 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 no. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are Christ, the Son of God. They received the words. They knew he was sent from God. Not just the outside world and the community and Nicodemus and the Pharisees. We know most of them rejected. <laughs> the disciples saw it too. And the confession shows us that. So we jumped a lot in Scripture. We looked at John 3. We've looked at now in, in, Luke, in Luke 4 with the prayer, what he was doing with praying. We looked at Luke, Luke, 4, Luke 6 with the prayer. We looked at verse Luke 4 with the reading of the temple. We looked at all these gospel narratives all these truths from previous parts of Jesus' ministry, and all of that leads him to this prayer. All of these events and these accounts lead Jesus to be reflective on everything that he's done and confirm these things to be true. They received the words. They knew he was sent from God. But for Jesus, that wasn't the most important thing for him to see from the disciples. Look back at verse 8 with me. Okay, the most important thing for Jesus to see from his disciples that they did indeed saw is that they believe that you, the Father, sent me, the Son. Look at that last part there. So faith is the answer to that question. What's the most important thing? Faith. Faith is believing with their hearts what they know to be true. And what's so fun about this passage and diving deep into every word of Jesus' prayer here, what's neat about dissecting this prayer is that earlier in verse 6, I'll just go back all the way there, earlier in verse 6 with the whole passage there, we see Jesus reflecting on the disciples from God's point of view and seeing how God being sovereign chose these men, chose these men as he gave Jesus these men out of the world. We see that right there. God's perspective. 
okay? People whom you gave out of the world. But here now to close, we see Jesus respect, reflecting on the disciples' perspective, which would have been man's point of view. And man's point of view here is watching them and watching him and then believing with their own free will and choice. Believing with their own free will of who God is and who this Jesus is. So we can see there God's sovereign choice in the beginning, God's sovereign hand, choosing the disciples, giving him out of the world, and now man's point of view of reflecting at their free choice that they have believed that you sent me. Pretty cool to see that. Jesus fully God in the flesh and how that coordinates together. Okay, but everything we've talked about here this morning was only possible because Jesus manifested the character, the name of God, which is the character of God, onto himself. He didn't just play the role of God on earth. He didn't just act out God. But instead, he became that role. Okay, he didn't play the role. He became the role. He wasn't an actor playing his part but became his part as God in the flesh. What the disciples would soon find out is that their friend, okay, their rabbi, didn't just come to teach and the world and reveal his deity to the world, but he came to die for the world. He came to die for the sins of the world. And that very thing right there, sin of the world, is our problem here. In the world, sin has come in the world through one man's trespass, Adam in the garden. Ever since that day, sin has not just polluted our own physical bodies, but the whole world in general. Sin is the problem. And in Romans 5, 12, it says, therefore, just as sin came in the world through one man's trespass and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Sin is our problem. Sin is our problem. But right before that, in verse 8, it says that God showed his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? Christ died for us. Christ, the guy in this prayer. Christ, the guy praying. Okay? So the gift is not like the transgression. Okay? Where I'm getting at with that is that the gift, the wages of sin is death, but now the free gift of God is eternal life. The gift is the newness of life that he offers us, the free gift of eternal life that is only possible by faith. We just read about how the disciples had faith. They believed in whom he sent. Okay, They believed in whom God the Father sent him, the Son. But the cross is our only hope. The cross is that gift. The wages of sin is death, but that free gift of God, salvation, is eternal life. And the free gift is not like the transgression, because the transgression leads to death, but the gift leads to eternal life. Do you see where I'm getting at with that? That is the hope. That is salvation. That is why Christ manifested the name of God in the first place. None of what we talked about would ever make sense of why he would step out of heaven, why he would become the nature of God, if this wasn't the plan, the beginning of the foundation of the earth, to provide salvation for mankind. Faith that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again. This is the gospel. This is our gospel that we can trust and live out. Okay, Sin may be the problem, but Christ is the solution because Christ gives us salvation. I pray that all of us have trusted the gospel. I pray that all of us have crossed this bridge from death to life. I pray that we are new creations, that the old has passed away. And if not, this is possible for us. This is possible. There's no magical wand we have to wave or prayer we have to say, but strictly coming by faith alone. Through grace alone. In Christ alone. Think of that. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, leads to salvation. Leads to the gift, which is not like 
the transgression. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for this prayer. We're thankful that we can dwell for sermon after sermon on just a few verses. Just a few words from a deep, reflective prayer we can study, we can dissect, we can ponder off of, and to see how you manifested the name of God. How you didn't just act out who God is, you didn't just play this role, but you became this role. Father, I pray for us that we come by faith, that we believe in the one whom sent this Jesus, that we believe in God the Father, that we trust what he has done for salvation. I pray that even a world of chaos and a world of sin and disorder, we can cling to the one thing that gives us hope and salvation, which is your son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for all these attributes, all the things that describe of who you are. We're thankful that it became flesh and lived out, not just by word, but with action. We thank your holy, precious Son, the Lord Jesus, for all he's given us. In your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. As we